What challenges face Riverside veterans as they return home? This panel explores how educational institutions, government, nonprofit organizations, and the community as a whole can better ease the transition back to civilian life. Hi, uh, my name is David Glidden. I'm a professor emeritus now of philosophy at UC Riverside. And I'm very grateful you could come and participate in this panel. It's a part of a series of conversations that's been held across the state of California about the issues facing veterans today. Now, I must say, when we organized this, and I knew we, I'd be presenting this, we would be presenting this in August, that I thought the wars would be over, uh, that it would be looking toward a new era where the, there would be no more uh, war uh, for us, at least, in uh, the Middle East, at least. And that's unfortunately not true. So many of the issues we'll be discussing today will be continuing on. It, it's a very different world where veterans today are part of a professional force, and so they do several tours of duty. And, and as a result of having many tours of duty, they often have a much more hard experience of war than even uh, those in Vietnam who often only had to serve a one year in combat. Let me introduce our panelists today. Uh, we have, uh, fortunately, the representative from Riverside in Congress, uh, Representative Mark DeCano. He is uh, especially valuable for us because he's a member of the Veterans Affairs Committee and the Education and Workforce Committee in our Congress. And as you may know, uh, an amazing thing happened this past uh, few months, a bipartisan bill to support veterans was passed by the House and passed by the Senate and made into law. And uh, uh, Congressman Takano will be talking about that. Uh, we also have, uh, now make sure I get your name pronounced right, um, Karen Young Lo, who is involved in Riverside County with uh, Lighthouse Services, a CEO of that organization that does a lot of work for uh, veterans and others who are finding themselves in, uh, in duress, homelessness, uh, people who are suffering from traumatic stress, people who are uh, addict addicts. And she helps provide help and services working with veterans as well as other groups of people. And uh, finally, I'm pleased to present uh, a former student of mine, uh, Jackie Kozich, mm -hmm. who is a, a veteran who served two tours of duty in the Navy uh, in the Gulf. Uh, one of which is now more well known because she was on the USS Boxer, which re rescued Captain Phillips, if you've seen the movie. Uh, and so she's, she is able to speak from her own experience of coming from uh, war zones, coming back to civilian life, and how to uh, affect that transition. So what we're going to do is have a conversation among th these three. I may intervene every now and then, but my family warns me that I talk too much already. I'll try not to do that. Uh, and then I'm encouraging you to ask questions. In your program, you have a, a, a card, uh, which uh, uh, there are pencils over there if you don't have one. And you could write down questions. So when we turn over to the full discussion, you'll be able to ask questions of the panelists. Uh, I'll be moderating them just so we don't ask the same question twice. So I will get the cards and I'll read them to our panelists, and you can direct them at the whole panel or whoever uh, is more appropriate. Uh, but well, let me begin uh, with Jackie. Uh, uh, Jackie, you came home from service abroad in a combat area, but how did the experience of coming home affect your re-entering the civilian population as a student at UCR, for example? Uh, were you able to share your experiences with others, and what are you, have you observed as a returning combat veteran to a different setting, re-entering into a civilian world. And if you talk about that a little bit, and then we'll have the other speakers talk, and we'll interact with each other. Please. OK, thank you, Dr. Glidden. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I did transition twice. Each deployment, any veteran goes on any branch of service, you come back a different person. There's a part of you you leave out there, and a new part you bring back. Um, 
going to school, I found a lot of issues um, with the GI Bill that I wasn't really um, ready for. They give us a transition class, but it's not really, um, it's, an, it's good information, but it's not enough. It's only a week long, and they don't really go into depth for what you need to do when you get out. Um, I did have um, fun, I guess, explaining my experiences with other people. Um, the VA office at your school will become your best friend because they know everything. They know more than you do, and there are some great people working in those offices. Um, I always explain transition into civilian life like um, like a big cheeseburger, okay? You're on deployment, and you're thinking about the best cheeseburger you ever had at home, okay? And it's juicy, it's you know melting with cheese everywhere. And you finally get home to have that burger, and when you, when you bite into it, it's almost a disappointment, and it's not as great as you remembered it. And I can describe um, deployment just like that. Uh, everything that you come home to is exactly like that. I wouldn't say it's a letdown, it's just very different than you had anticipated it. And um, <laughs> when you're at home, you don't really know where to go because you're, you're not really used to it. You, you think it's your life, but it's not really your life anymore. You're now a veteran, you're now you know, participated in active duty war, um, and when you 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 find yourself in between, so when there um, is that in between, there's just some inconsistencies, and you have to really find yourself. So any help you can get, any any service you can get from anyone will help you. And like I said, there is a transition class, but when that transition class happens and it's over, you're not really listening. Um, so when it is over, you get cut off pretty much, like my friend said over here. Mm -hmm. um, you get cut off very much. And um, by then, your CAT card, your little ID card, has expired. And it's very hard to understand and get the services you need when you actually need them. And so that's, again, why I'm sitting here today to try to help people out, because I know I had a very hard time trying to transition into the educational world of things. So. And David, can, may I just piggyback just a bit uh, uh, on what uh, Jackie said, do, if that's OK, do. only because um, I had the opportunity to talk with several of my veteran, but also um, many of my staff. And really, Jackie, that is the exact point that they brought out. They talked about the fact that when you're about to transition home, you do have this class, and it's the TAPS class. But the problem is uh, that the veterans explained to me is that you know it's not real. You know, you're you're still in the military. You're not really um, paying um, as close attention. I think they say it's good information, but it's only a week, maybe two weeks now um, long. Um, and they they felt that they really weren't ready to hear that information. And because I'm I'm one that says okay, well let's identify the problem, but then let's since we have the congressman here, let's also talk a little bit about some of the solutions that that might be appropriate. So. Um, one thing that my staff talked about, and I, I shared this with Jackie prior to um, starting the forum, was maybe having something that was then man mandated for folks to come back like a TAPS phase two. After they, they've you know come home, they've done the transition, some of their real world issues um, have hit them. You know, they've, they've had some of those family challenges, um, they've maybe had some other challenges, um, so that then they're really better able to um, more effectively use the information that they're provided um, within uh, the TAPS uh, program. So, so my staff talked a lot about that. And then also um, about different supports that might be uh, sponsorships and some of the um, veteran um, organizations, not just the VA, but some of the other veteran organizations that might be able to work as sponsors and work with the veteran in, in that transition and, and bringing them home. So I just wanted to, just because you brought up the TAPS program, no, I wanted great. to really and I, um, share about Just to piggyback that. on what you're piggybacking on. <laughs> We're just going to piggyback all night. This is, okay. uh, <laughs> and, and, and to bring uh, our Congressman Mark Takano into the discussion, we have this new veterans bill, mm -hmm. uh, which you've actually supported, helped amend it, and it's now law. Uh, what kind of help can the uh, Veterans Administration and the government do to help people make a transition to civilian life? Uh, what are the opportunities educationally, and how does this a large, huge uh, challenge get met by the new law. If you could talk about that, please, and address these is other issues. Well, well, first of all, before I begin, uh, let me say to Jackie, welcome home. Thank you. <laughs> and let me say to the other veterans uh, that I see in the audience, uh, welcome home, welcome home. And 
I, I say that even to Vietnam veterans when mm -hmm. I um, at veterans events or World War II veterans um, or Korean War veterans. Um, I, I'm always careful to say welcome home because you can't say it enough because it's a process for people, uh, especially for um, our veterans who've suffered the traumas of, uh, uh, and sometimes, you know, the, 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 well, the thrill. Um, I think part of the, uh, the, the struggle for many of our veterans that, that come back uh, to an ordinary existence, they've seen extreme situations that, have, that, re that required extreme, that required a tremendous um, summoning mm -hmm. of, uh, of themselves to respond. Uh, and they have to adjust to a world that uh, knows, has no capability of understanding what you've been through. No matter how many movies we watch, uh, you, you, there's this, uh, there's this, there is a philosophical problem, David. It's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to show off, but I'm going to show off. But, the, you know, you, Wittgenstein talked about, uh, is a philosopher who, who talked about, the, you know, how possible is it for us to communicate uh, and uh, and so much of the war literature we know about is about this experience that you really aren't able to explain fully to folks and the rest of the world doesn't understand. And here's the problem is that a very small percentage of our nation has really gone to war. Uh, a large number of our population understood the experience uh, of World War II veterans coming back because we were so much of the nation was engaged and everybody was engaged in in it and so in in the war effort in some way from Victory Gardens uh, to the tremendous numbers of both men and women who participated in the war effort. Uh, but even then, um, if you looked at movies or literature, uh, there's still the theme of the incomprehensibility, the inability to communicate about what happened, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so we, we have a tremendous responsibility, uh, the rest of us who've benefited from the sacrifices that our soldiers have made. Um, we've asked them to do things that are sinful. We've asked them to do things, uh, I mean, the mothers worry about whether or not their, their sons and daughters are gonna go to heaven. You know, uh, uh, did you kill anybody? Uh, you know, these are, these are heavy, heavy spiritual things that people deal with. So it's, no accident we have a philosopher who's leading our discussion today. These are, these are big deal questions. And hopefully many of our soldiers, our enlisted people will end up in liberal arts programs, in the humanities, uh, to write about these things and to uh, talk about these things and to make movies about these things uh, so that we as a culture and a society can, can, uh, can understand, can, can try to understand what you've been through and to, and to uh, be your American family. So, um, uh, we, we in the Congress, uh, I, I didn't do this, but before I got there, uh, uh, there was a very generous package of educational benefits uh, put through. Uh, 36 months of education will be paid for by the government, um, up to seven, uh, a maximum of $17,000 per year. Um, that can actually be adjusted upward depending on whether or not the higher ed institution is a quote unquote yellow ribbon institution, um, a private institution that uh, will work with the student and the government to uh, provide uh, um, a discount against their normal tuition and fees. Um, uh, so there's a very generous uh, GI bill, post 9-11 uh, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans bill. Um, the, 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 believe it or not, the administration, uh, President Obama has actually tried to uh, improve upon the transition assistant program that you referred to that uh, seems like uh, they're not really ready to hear it, but actually they've been required to do it as a part of their separation from the military. That's um, great. It's, a, it's a, been a requirement. Um, and uh, oddly enough, uh, I've dealt with members on Republican members on the committee who are normally averse to adding more regulation requirement. <laughs> they, actually, they actually were concerned that commanders uh, would not let the service members actually go to these, um, uh, go, to the, go to the TAP program. So they actually, uh, earlier, earlier last year, they were, there was this dispute between the administration and some of the Republican members about um, 
you know, mandating that the commanders let them go. And, and you know, actually in a bipartisan way, we, I think, agreed uh, to do that. Um, uh, so one of the things that, that I've been interested in as a member of Congress is trying to introduce this idea of preparing our service members much earlier, actually from the day they mm -hmm. arrive That's for a great service. Idea. <laughs> and that, as, that part of the duty of your commander, um, part of his or her responsibility is to prepare you eventually to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is kind of a paradoxical thing for the military. And, and it's hard because the military is about the mission. And it's hard for them to see this as part of their mission, mm -hmm. uh, that, that they're also responsible for um, mm -hmm. assisting uh, those under their command uh, to eventually separate, uh, to keep, um, uh, to, to constantly update, say, your record and your resume and the skills that you've attained and the courses you're taking. Um, and it's gonna be a little bit different for the Marine that may serve a three to five year stint uh, than the person that's going to stay in 20 years. Now, me quickly, I've taken more time than I want, but uh, David, you asked me about the, um, uh, the, the relevancy of the Veterans Bill. The Veterans Bill would be passed. It was quite remarkable. It's about $17 billion in mandatory spending, which is really unusual because almost every, getting new money spent out of this Congress is really difficult. Um, in fact, it's the other way around. We, we shut down the government. I didn't shut it down. I voted to make that clear. <laughs> I did not shut down the government. <laughs> um, but the dispute was over last, last October was about not cutting enough out of the government. Um, I was among those who thought that, uh, you know, uh, that we should not shut down the government over the fact we're not cutting enough out. And um, uh, so, so what this bill, of new spending does is it addresses an emergency that arose out of this scandal in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, there was a waiting list scandal, um, a manipulation of waiting lists. Uh, basically, uh, uh, veterans were, were not being served in a timely way by the healthcare system, by the VA there. And that led to a full scale investigation by the Veterans Committee. Uh, and this bill was formed as a solution. Now, how this relates to the transition is that so many of our, of our recent uh, uh, veterans um, from the Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts um, have had, uh, they've, they've, they've been uh, well-documented uh, cases of people committing suicide because they haven't been able to get uh, access mm -hmm. to mental health care, they're suffering from post-traumatic stress, and uh, we have a shortage, both in the private sector and in the VA, uh, uh, mental, health, uh, mental health practitioners, especially uh, psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was recognized by the committee that we, we had a shortage of physicians. That was, that was a problem for the VA, and that's part of the reason why we had a, a, uh, a, 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 a wait list problem. Uh, uh, that was exacerbated by the, by the way that the waitlists were administered. But, but we also recognized that there was a, a shortage. So the bill, what the bill does do is it, uh, for, those, for, those, for those veterans that have been on waiting lists for over a month and who live more than 40 miles away from a health uh, facility, uh, they can go seek care at a private practitioner and that private practitioner will be reimbursed at the Medicare rate. Uh, and that, if you know anything about healthcare, the Medicare reimbursement rate is, mm -hmm. is a pretty good yes. inducement. Um, uh, the other part of it is that we increased the number of, of uh, amount of funding for the VA to actually go and hire more doctors. Uh, but I argued that that would do little good in a context where we have a national shortage of physicians. and. and uh, we, we have a medical school at UCR, the latest, uh, the newest medical school, yay. <laughs> However, people don't know that most of, the, well, the supply of doctors is really regulated not by medical school graduates, it's really the residencies. Um, and nearly all the residencies are funded by the federal government, mostly by Medicare and Social Security. Um, and the arguments over Medicare and Social Security 
uh, would have played out like we saw the shutdown uh, in October of last year. Uh, the one place where the Congress can seem to come together is on veterans, and so 10% of residencies are funded by the federal government, uh, are, are funded through that budget. So um, uh, when Senator Sanders uh, got his bill through the Senate and the House got its bill through, uh, the one thing that was missing uh, was the medical residency, medical residency uh, increase. And I said, well, it does no good for us to have, uh, to hire more doctors when there aren't any. And mm -hmm. it does no good to give uh, veterans the ability to use private health care when there's a shortage there as well. Uh, and uh, so uh, we, I was able to get an amendment into the conference report, which added 1,500 additional residency slots. Uh, and to give you some idea what that means, we've essentially been frozen under Medicare and Medicaid since 1996. Uh, so this is an, you know, a significant increase. And we, we need more. It's not, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. um, but it'll, it gives the Secretary of the Veterans Affairs the ability to target those residencies in the most needed areas, primary care, um, psychiatry, ophthalmology, uh, and, and other specialty areas. But prim primary care is, is, a, is a huge issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so great. it's a long right. answer. No, this, but, is, uh, this is great. It's yeah. Putting it in context, there are all these puzzles. We're trying to fit together how to produce a, a better experience for veterans as they come back to the United States. Now, uh, Karen, you've seen uh, cases of, of great trauma. People are trying to deal with it. Uh, they come back, they find that they, their job is gone and that there's no way of getting that job back. So often you can get a veteran who's been uh, regularly working and doing his job or her job and suddenly finds himself or herself homeless. Uh, and then there are, of course, people who come back uh, from uh, dry zones, and so the temptation to let go and to uh, start drinking to just relieve the, the dreams of the terrors of the experience, and it's uh, allowable, uh, unlike in the Middle East where it's not, uh, that can often produce alcohol issues, a uh, common issue across the population in general. And then there are the people who suffer so many concussions from uh, bombs going off or their, uh, their military vehicles getting blown up, that they have all sorts of issues of, of traumatic stress. So, so would you talk a bit about, about your work with this population and how that integrates into the issue of coming back to live a normal civilian life again? Is it possible? David, I think it is. And, and I'd, I'd like to just um, let the congressman know that one of the things that my staff talked about, and I was sharing this also with uh, Jackie a little bit earlier, um, is the fact that they talked about the fact that really transition and talking about transition should really begin at the recruitment stage. Um, you know, so I'm really um, happy to hear that you know that you're in agreement um, with that. Um, but David, you're very right. Um, a lot of our um, soldiers are coming home with um, TBIs, which are traumatic brain um, injuries. Um, they're coming home with post-traumatic stress issues. Um, they're coming home with other physical issues that are then, because um, of all the trauma related to their physical issues, are then exacerbated by depression and significant mental health issues. And not being able to um, access um, the system of care. Um, and sometimes also not knowing where to go, not knowing um, what types of benefits are available to them. Lots of veterans talk with me about the fact that, um, you know, they didn't know that they could go to the VA or that um, they thought that we on I only went to the VA for physical health and I couldn't get the um, psychological support, um, you know, that I needed. Um, so I, I think it is it is a huge issue. Um, also the fact that um, many of our veterans um, begin to self-medicate uh, some of their mental illness um, with drugs and alcohol, but also what we're seeing quite a bit of is them self-medicating um, their issues with prescription uh, medications, prescription pain medications that then become um, an addiction, um, a kind of doctor hopping, you know, even within our VA system, you know, going here and being able to access, um, you know, uh, those drugs and alcohol. And so we're seeing that um, more and more um, our veterans are coming home with the, the real need um, for supportive services through mental health um, supportive services, through employment uh, supportive services, as well as physical um, health supportive services. Um, I think that it behooves um, those um, employers that talk about the fact that they're veteran friendly. 
um, to really be able to um, understand um, and, and be able to ask the right questions about how a veteran's, um, his, his or her experiences when um, they were in active duty can then translate um, into the, you know, the needs of the company. But also our veteran uh, need to be able to clearly articulate um, how they're gonna be a benefit and how, um, you know, what, they, what they've been doing for the past year, the past five years, the past six years, 10 years, how that can translate into, um, um, real worth um, on the uh, working in a, at a civilian company so um, I know that our program we do a lot of talking um, with our veteran about that we do a lot of um, prepping them through our transitional um, living program on preparing themselves for resumes um, helping them to articulate um, not only the things that they did when they were um, in active duty and how they can translate that to an employer but also the things and the survival techniques that they utilize when they were in homelessness, and how they can help uh, you know help an employer to know you know this is how I survived. These are the things that I had to do, and 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 it's it's wonderful. Our folks are are getting um, employed, but I'm glad to hear that um, we're going to have more medical uh, um, support uh, for our veteran because I really believe that that is really the key: um, more mental health support and more physical health um, support. Yeah. Karen, if you could elaborate on the the point about employers. Employing veterans is not a charitable act. It's good for the business because veterans have been used to working regular hours. You don't slack off in the Navy or Army uh, or Air Force or Marines. You've got to show up. You've got to do your job. And sometimes these are long hours, 14 hours on, 12 hours on, day after day, every day. And so they're, they have skills which they bring to the employer. Most definitely, they bring the skills, excellent. Do they, but do the employers appreciate that? I, I, sometimes I think not, and, and that's what I'm hearing from my veteran. Um, they have great leadership skills, organizational skills. Um, our veteran have the capacity to get a little bit of information in terms of how you want it done, and then to go in there, attack it, and expound on it, because that's what they had to do when they were in the service. You know, they might, you know, they'll, they'll get an order, but you better go, be able to go in there, do that, and do everything else that's around to support whatever that order was. I mean, I, I think that's that's what I hear. You you know, Jackie. So I, I would agree with you. I think that these leadership skills, these organizational skills, these um, skills to be able to see the larger picture um, and to be able to do whatever is necessary to get the job done, I think are wonderful skills that our veteran um, bring to, you know, to any employer. Um, I myself, you know, employ a significant amount of veteran um, on my staff. And those are the wonderful skills that, that they bring um, to our other veteran who are seeking services. Well, not to embarrass uh, Jackie, though, I'm I'm sure she will be. She was a student of mine. In all my 42 years of teaching in colleges and universities, there's been only one student who always turned in her papers two or three days early. Uh, and I immediately drew this connection that, Jackie, you learn to get your job done as quickly as you can and to do it efficiently. So I really benefited from having you in a classroom. If you go online, you find out when students turn in their papers through, the, through a computer assessment system, and most of them are three in the morning, four in the morning, five in the morning of the paper being due at nine in the morning. But uh, Jackie always turned in her papers, these are long, serious philosophy papers, uh, two or three days in advance. So did, in your experience in the military, there's a skill of getting your job done. Uh, oh, yes. Does it transfer over to civilian life? It does. Veteran students are very, very efficient at what they want to do. Um, a lot of the, the things we, we talk about together are the kids that go to school, that their parents pay for everything, and they're, they kind of blow it off. They blow off education like, oh, I failed this class. But if we fail a class, we flip out. You know, that's, the, it's, that's our benefits that's going away. That's, that's, what, that's our money that we made for ourselves. This is our security. Um, so when you do have a veteran student, there, there are things that, that come over like um, efficiency and doing it right and doing it well the first time because that's what they do teach you in the military in any branch, really. Um, my problem is that I, I did have anxiety um, when coming home. And so for me, finishing my papers three days early uh, or a week early would help me with my anxiety. And as long as it was done, then it was okay. Um, and there are a lot of students that don't know how to deal with that anxiety. But um, I mean, like I said, veteran students are, are very 
they're just very different. And a lot of teachers aren't aware that there are veteran students within the classroom. And so sometimes they um, put on their political beliefs, believe it or not, and they don't, they don't know who they're talking to in the classroom a lot. And, and um, it does, it, I think it does need to be made aware of that teachers need to be aware, very aware of who's in their classroom. Because I don't look like a veteran. I, I look like one. Everyone always tells me that, oh, you're a veteran. And they'll, they'll talk about veterans in front of me like, they, like I don't know what I'm talking about, which is, which is fine. I don't mind correcting them. Uh, <laughs> So it's not that bad. But um, Professor Glidden's class, he had a class called Care of the Soul. And I have to tell you, it changed my life. It helped my anxiety. It helped me breathe. Um, philosophy is not something to be taken lightly, but, but I think all veterans should actually have to take a class in philosophy so they can relax and learn how to breathe, those breathing exercises, and learn how to move on. Um, with whatever happened on your deployment. Because like I said, everyone has a different deployment. Everyone comes back with different things. Um, and like Karen said, a lot of the things that the, the VA, people coming back with PTSD, there's so much pride in getting help, the help that you need. So even if you know where the services are and how to get them, you won't go. Because there is a stigma that is erased with PTSD and depression and, and bipolar. And um, I mean, a lot of friends of mine have PTSD. And there uh, is one in particular that I'm on the suicide list for. Um, and I actually got called um, the other day because he had blown up in the VA medical center. <laughs> and uh, he kind of made a big fit. And before he could actually get his counseling session that he went originally for, they made him take anger management and all these other classes. So now they, they're medicating him on top of his actual physical meds, uh, which is blows my mind because this guy is, is one of the most intelligent people IT wise that I know. Uh, he is he is brilliant and they're it's almost like they're dimming his light with all the medication they're putting him on because he had one blow up at the VA and I don't know if any of you have ever been to any VA but it is very hard and, uh, and another issue is the VA is being closed on the weekends um, or medical centers like Karen was saying sometimes the emergencies are open but seeing a doctor trying to get an appointment even after five on the weekday is really hard so that's hard on students that's hard on on working parents especially, and like Karen mentioned before this too, is that she has someone who has a kid, and if you if your kid gets sick and you used up all your days to go get your own things taken care of, then then you you know you're out of luck, and that that's just horrible and not even not acceptable. I mean, any veteran that served any time should be able to go to any hospital, any dentistry, and go be helped no matter what, no, regardless of your insurance card or anything. I mean, just show them your DD-214, you'll be good, right? <laughs> but I mean, there's, there's so many issues surrounding um, veterans trying to go to school. Homelessness is one. The GI Bill, with each school, you have to go through different processes. It's a lot of paperwork. So um, a lot of, well, not a lot, but there are a few who actually become homeless and jobless waiting for that money to come in because it takes so long to actually come through which is also unacceptable. So um, yeah, dealing with things like that, seeing veterans homeless, seeing my, my people homeless, it's, uh, it is, it's sad to me that this is America, this is the country they're fighting for. Um, someone also brought to my attention that um, there have been some veterans that have been deported because they weren't citizens before. And then when they came back, and they came back with, uh, with PTSD or anxiety problems, and they, they committed a crime, they did their time for the crime, and then were deported. Um, Mexico is one of the biggest ones, but there's also 19 other neighboring countries that we have veterans deported in. Now, there is no law that states they can't be, um, they can't be buried here, though what there is a law that they can't come back. Obviously, they're deported. Um, I think that's also ridiculous. I think if they, they serve their time and they actually serve this country, then they should, I think it should be kind of accepted as long as they are rehabilitated and everything goes on well. Um, like I said, a lot of issues. That's there around. are. Uh, C Congressman Takano, you, you have uh, spent a night in a homeless shelter uh, for Path of Life. And no doubt, some of the people there must have been, uh, may have been veterans. So th th it's hard getting oh, yeah. them to tech, talk about why they're there. It's very hard. I, I also I feed feed people at Path of Life's family shelter, and people hunker down. And although there may be 50 people in a room much smaller than this, sleeping and eating there, there's a, a reluctance to talk. But you've experienced being with people who, for various reasons, are, are down and out. Uh, uh, 
uh, how can uh, the Veterans Administration, sorry, it's a little alarm clock telling me not to talk too much. Uh, <laughs> how can the Veterans Administration be more personally responsive in the way it, it helps its veterans so as to give people courage, hope, and faith and to find ways of, of overcoming the grief of, of PTSD, which often means acting out, or the problems of homelessness. Uh, from your both experience in the Veterans Committee and your experience at the Path of Life Shelter. Well, you know, it's really I've been in office about a year and seven months, year and eight months or so, and um, you know, I certainly know a lot more than I knew at the big, uh, when I started, uh, and I'm still trying to wrap my arms around uh, uh, the challenges. And uh, certainly, I've learned a lot just listening to Jackie. Uh, mm -hmm. She's raised more questions for me uh, to go and. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm actually hoping that I can take this uh, recording of this of this uh, event tonight and share it with my colleagues. Um, and uh, I know my staff; they're they're taking notes as well. Um, let me let me say that um, uh, the previous secretary, um, uh, Secretary Shinseki, uh, yes. in some of his comments, uh, acknowledged uh, that. Uh, the VA had a, had a tremendous challenge uh, with homelessness, and he did set the goal of trying to end veterans' homelessness by the year 2015. Um, he was very proud of the fact that uh, homelessness stayed flat, that it did not increase during the economic downturn. Um, and indeed, I think that is an accomplishment, the fact that in the downturn we see homelessness rise, but the fact that we were able to keep it from increasing um, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, that's, uh, how, how do I want to say this? I mean, the, we, it's still inexcusable. We have still the people who are on that flat curve, uh, under that flat curve, uh, still suffering from homelessness. Um, he said something about also his distress over, over medication, mm -hmm. that we didn't have enough practitioners, not enough counselors, not enough psychiatrists and that it was an over-reliance. Or that they weren't personable. There's a lot of uh, psychiatrists that haven't been through the veteran at all. And though they have so much training, mm -hmm. it's so hard to try to tap into what you don't know about and what you're incapable of seeing, like you said earlier. Yeah, so, uh, and, and I'm, I, have a bit, I have some reservations about whether or, or not uh, the private healthcare is gonna have anybody any better, mm -hmm. and so, uh, so we have a shortage uh, in that arena too, uh, especially in areas such as ours. Uh, Riverside County alone is the eighth largest veterans population by county in the country. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, what if know, we created uh, some incentives for veterans specifically to become in the psychology field or in humanities, anything like that, um, on the medical side, so they could help our own? I, uh, I think. Uh, I think we can pursue that sort of idea. Mm -hmm. um, well, because you know, like the biggest problem, also, I'm just sorry, really quick, um, is that 36 months for the GI Bill. It is only 36 months. So if you do want to get your doctorate, you do want to become a psychologist. You're limited, and then other than that, you have to you have to do financial aid, and that's really hard, especially when you're trying to work and you're trying to support yourself at the same time. And there's also no carryover. So so if someone um, say it's summertime, and and they're not actively in class, then their aid stops. And so that's really, a, it's for families, it's a very, very challenging financial situation to see yourself in. And what ends up happening is, is those are the folks who, who we're seeing. We're seeing folks who, um, you know, they're fine when they're getting their GI Bill, and then they stopped classes in June. And so for, you know, July, August, and September, you know, they're, they're not getting that, that housing allowance or, or anything. Gap. And Huge. so they fall behind in, you know, in there. And so, you know, so it's a it's a challenge and and maybe the question is well you know maybe they should you know save more but it, it's just not it, it's not enough when, when you're when you're trying to pay for classes and you know that the yeah. housing allowance Because who wants to hire big. a veteran for three months yeah. and then oh I'm quitting thanks for the job you know <laughs> like so it is really hard for that that th those three months are very very hard very hard and so so the idea here is that when you end the calendar year the academic school year suddenly you're going to be unemployed mm -hmm. uh, and your benefits stop 
And if you've got a family, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a, it's a, you starve till September. Yeah, and you're you're then behind. You know, you, if you get a month or two b behind in rent, th right. then you're so behind, and it's so difficult to to catch up. And I'm I'm so glad that you brought up Secretary Shinseki because, truly. He has, he has been a wonderful advocate for homeless services. And under his watch, um, you know, there, were a, there was a lot of money uh, put into homeless services. Under his watch, the Supportive Services for Veteran Families, which is our program, um, you know, was funded. And right now, we have 300 providers um, nationwide. And what our program does, I just want to tell everyone, because it um, provides homeless prevention as well as rapid rehousing services for veteran and veterans' families. So what does that mean? So that means that that veteran who lost um, his or her benefits over um, the um, that, that summertime can then come to us and we'll provide case management services, some um, financial literacy, um, budgeting services, and things like and all those kinds of supportive services. But we're also able through this particular program to provide some temporary financial assistance. So that means that we can help with that rent payment, we can help with you know that utility payment, um, we can help with the moving cost if they need to relocate. Locate. And that was one of the, you know, the brain children of uh, um, Secretary Shinseki. So it's been very successful. And then those people who are um, actually homeless, they're in a shelter or they're living somewhere that's not meant for human habitation, um, we have the ability to assist them with getting housing quickly. Um, so that means rapidly helping them with um, security deposits, with first month's rent, with moving costs, with emergency um, supply costs. So if they need certain things for their jobs or, or books for school or whatever, we can tap into that. So it, it is limited, but um, but I mean, he is just, he was a, a wonderful advocate uh, for for homeless services. There's interestingly enough a parallel issue with foster children who have no parents and at 18 they're going to the University of California. But the University of California will provide them support during the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Also scholarships to go to school if they do that in the summer and jobs so that they have a family because they have no family. All of a sudden they're out on their own trying to survive. And so perhaps there's a need for something similar for veterans. Some way of transitioning from semester to semester uh, as long as they're continuing to go in school to help them make it through the non-school year mm -hmm. weeks when someone's a foster child and unless they have friends uh, they have no place to go they're over 18 and they're in college but then where are they it's a similar situation isn't it i i would agree and i think another big help that, that many of us know and I'm, I'm sure that the congressman is, is working on and I see uh, Grant uh, back there, hi Grant. <laughs> Um, you know, really is the idea that we need more help and we need more support on getting um, our veteran the service-connected disability that they are entitled to. Um, we have a backlog. I know that the, you know, the VA, Veteran Benefit Services, they're working very, very hard to um, take care of that. But when thinking about um, providing additional resources for a veteran um, who do have a disability, getting their service-connected or non-service-connected disability payments coming to them and, and them not having to wait years and years or months and months um, for that, I think would be very helpful also. Yeah, I, I, certainly um, I, I, I'm appreciative of the state of California for um, budgeting, um, uh, I think it was uh, strike teams, three strike teams, and I, I think they had strike teams of 15. I don't remember the exact number, but the, the strike teams, uh, three teams, uh, were uh, sent to help the three different VA uh, offices here in California uh, to expedite the processing of, of, the, of the claims. Um, uh, I see in the audience uh, one of my employees, Captain, uh, Reserve Captain Ignacio Romero, who has assisted, uh, along with some of my other staff members, uh, so many veterans who have come in to get assistance with their uh, with their disability claims. And uh, uh, I w wish that congressional offices didn't have to do so much of that work, not because I, 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 dis I dislike the, the burden of my staff. I, I, I gladly and proudly uh, dedicate um, very efficient and competent staff to that task. 
Um, it's just that I, I, I want the VA to uh, be far more efficient. Yeah. Uh, and, and to give the VA some bit of slack here, uh, the secretary, uh, the previous secretary, Shinseki, did uh, open up a huge uh, number of new, uh, well, uh, widened the eligibility mm -hmm. uh, for disability to uh, people who are exposed to Agent Orange. Yes. And so it increased uh, uh, vastly the number of claims that, uh, the, that the VA had to process. Um, sorry to say that much of the VA uh, was uh, 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 not under automation. Uh, a lot of, they were still processing paper claims up to mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Uh, they have made great strides in, in digitizing uh, the claim process. Uh, I have to give this administration a lot of credit. Uh, they increased funding for the, for the VA uh, tremendously. Um, and uh, so there's, there's still much to do. Um, I, I just want to return a little bit to what Jackie was, uh, what, what you said uh, about uh, how Professor Glidden's class um, uh, Helped you deal with no, but I, David. I, I mean, I, I know I, I, it's, I, I know it's it embarrassing, but but uh, what I want to get to is this notion that we we can treat veterans through empathetic and sympathetic uh, practitioners, uh, psychiatrists, and you mentioned that um, a lot of them uh, didn't have the, the understanding of what uh, or, or really uh, sensitivity to what was going on, mm -hmm. uh, what, what was going on with many of their their patients. In many cases, they're, the caseloads are just really huge. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. And the medication is sort of a, an expedient form of dealing with that, that patient's suffering, the vet's suffering. Um, but, you know, uh, this, this notion that, um, uh, that the anxiety that you were experiencing was also dealt with through the kind of thinking that you had to do. Mm -hmm. um, so whether it's Professor Glidden, who I'm sure is a skilled and uh, gifted teacher, um, that, that, the, that the humanities have a very special role maybe to play oh, in yeah. serving our veterans because um, um, we can treat the anxiety uh, mm -hmm. with, with medication, we can treat it with uh, psychotherapy, we can, mm -hmm. but, but, but also maybe perhaps uh, part part of what how we how we need to address is is uh, address it is 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 is, is show the, the power of the humanities in terms mm -hmm. of the veterans being able. So I'll, I'll well, stop. And have you no, comment on that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because I am one of those prideful veterans that don't want to get any help. So <laughs> um, I actually fell into Professor Glidden's class um, just because I needed to take a class, and I was like, "Well, care of the soul. That sounds great." You know, and uh, I went into it, and like I said, it changed my life. Everything about the class. Uh, he took us outside to walk in the grass barefoot. Um, a Buddhist with, walking exercise. It was it was something you had to be open for, but my goodness, it just it really did open you up, and it learned. It just taught you to be able to move with yourself, I guess, and live in the present instead of thinking about the past or thinking about what you have to do later. It slows your mind because in this generation, we are just crazy with technology and apps and phones and and we're everywhere all the time no matter what and it it was really nice to have one moment to be outside to be actually outside with my feet in the grass who who's when's the last time you guys did that you know so your feet in the grass walking around learning how to breathe and not caring what anybody else is looking at you when you're doing it but uh it was it was an experience to say the least and uh i, I really do thank you for that thank well, you well, i'm embarrassed but let me say this about the importance of the humanities the humanities are the best when they get us all of us to feel at home with one another and connected to one another and the humanities cover all sorts of experiences of life from the Homer's Iliad is all about post-traumatic stress after Achilles loses his friend <laughs> Patroclus. Uh, these are the dimensions of human existence. But we began with welcome home. And welcome home means to be connected to one another, not to be alone. To be able to share through either veteran support groups or just friends what you've been through in a supportive, helpful way so that when you make this transition from being in war to being at peace, you'll be at peace because you have people who 
are grateful for what you've done to save us, uh, loyal to you as you've been loyal to them, and are open to listening to what you have to say. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, what education can do. And this is what part of this program is supposed to do, is the, the last of these series of conversations for the uh, Cal Humanities UCHRI project. But part of what we'd like to do is to hear from you. If you have questions you want to say, uh, you can put them on a, a, a card uh, yeah, uh, over there, and I can read the questions so that, and collect them. Uh, or if uh, you don't have a pen or pencil with you, you can ask a question by raising your hand, sir. Great, thank you very much. And here's, here's the book, and there are free copies over there for those of you who want to participate in this reading and discussion group to continue this discussion. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, Jackie, thank you for your service. Besides being appreciative, what else can we civilians do to support veterans in our daily interactions? Talk to them. You never know who is a veteran. You never know who is sitting by you who, who had some time. Just talk to people like they're people, really. That's all you can do. Um, helping veterans, there are plenty, plenty of uh, societies to give to, um, charities to give to that can help veterans more ways in more ways than you possibly can because um, they know a lot. They, um, I mean, they, they specialize, like Karen and her, her, I mean, you can always give to Karen's this little thing over there. So, I mean, she's got a lot going on. She's has some great programs and giving is probably the best way you can do it. Um, also, if you see somebody struggling and you don't necessarily know they're a veteran, um, don't ever really assume people, everyone's fighting their own battles, whether they're a veteran or not. Um, I mean, like I said, just talk to people, treat them like they're human. Don't put a stigma on any any veteran or anybody. And um, that's, about, that's about it. And can I just also Please add do. one other thing? Um, you know, it's wonderful, and I think all nonprofits, you know, we appreciate um, you know people giving to um, our organizations, but also I think giving of your time. Uh, David was talking about um, you know community and. Um, you know, when, when, when the veteran were in active duty, um, you know, there was a community that, that they developed. And so now they need to come home and, and become a part of the civilian community. And um, so I think donating your time, we have a, a number of um, uh, volunteers 
uh, that come in and do all sorts of things uh, with our veteran, from um, running groups, uh, to just sitting down and talking with them, um, to taking them to some of the different um, things that they need to go to. So there's always the opportunity to um, provide um, you know, monetary support, and we all appreciate that, but also just your support of being there and, and calling up an agency and saying, hey, what is it? What, what do you need? What, what, do the, what do the vets need? What can we do? Hey, can we come out? No, I had a group, of, a young lady who is a veteran, um, she works for the housing authority. Instead of having a birthday party, uh, she got a group of friends together, and as their gift to her, they came out and did some work on our facility. And, they, um, and after they did the work, they had a big barbecue uh, for the vets, just to say thank you for your service, and it was wonderful. So, so there are lots of ways that you could give back, including just giving back of your time. And, and also, just really quick, I'd like to add, there's a, um, an organization called NAMI. It's National Alliance of Mental Illness. And I know there's a lot of families struggling with it, whether it's veteran or not. Um, and that is specifically for the families to actually talk about their experiences. It's a safe place to where those, those stories only stay within those families. And it's a great way to, to have to help the family because to have, help the family of a struggling veteran is huge because they are their biggest support systems. I know my parents, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my parents. I um, got in a motorcycle accident last year and they had my mother literally wheeled me in class for six hours for my summer classes in a wheelchair. Um, the whole summer and um, you know, she took a lot of her own time to be able to do that And so if I didn't have my parents as support I I wouldn't be here like I said so uh, Support is huge and the family is is the biggest support they will ever have so NAMI is great if you need to vent and the veterans or the mental illness they, they are mentally ill they don't come it's just for the families. So it's just for families to talk. And, and when you find a middle ground, it starts to seem normal to everyone. It starts to seem like, okay, now everyone, I'm not alone in dealing with this. There's so many families dealing with so many things. Thank you. There's a question related to this to Representative Takano. Our recently passed Proposition 41 will provide $600 million to build permanent supportive housing for vets. Unfortunately, the bill does not provide funding for services, providing more uh, project-based uh, VASH vouchers would help provide services. Uh, can you comment on providing more project-based support to assist chronically homeless vets in addition to housing support? Well, my, I think where that question is coming from is uh, there's, uh, there are vouchers available through um, HUD, housing, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, and, and uh, they're called, with regard to uh, project-based um, uh, funding, the vouchers aren't given out to individual veterans, right? They're, uh, they're, um, they're project-based, so, and they're, they're, yes. they're allocated uh, to certain uh, projects. Yeah, and so the veteran can take it, and the veteran can still decide where he or she wants to live by having one of the vouchers. Mm -hmm. So um, they become an important part of, uh, say, a, a, a housing project that uh, is intended for uh, disabled veterans, uh, mm -hmm. and we can integrate services into that wraparound services, mm -hmm. and these HUD VAD, these HUD HUD -Vash. VASH mm -hmm. HUD VASH vouchers um, are intended to do that. Unfortunately, we have to uh, try to bundle them uh, to if they're all bundled together and they all are used at a at a certain at a certain project. Um, that's what allows enough. A cash flow to kind of create these wraparound services. Right. Well, the 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 veteran can take a take their voucher and they can they can decide as long as the landlord um, is going to accept their voucher in terms of um, where to live. But um, I, I think that the um, question is very right. I actually went to um, the forum that they had, and so um, we we have this money uh, to build these um, to build houses and, and to build apartments and things like that for um, homeless veteran. But all of the money is going towards the building of the program and none of the money is going, there's very limited funding going to the supportive services. So what we, we need to kind of figure out is how can we, yes, build the permanent supportive housing, but also have the services that the veteran need in order to stay oh, in see. that housing, case management services, mental health services, substance abuse services. So um, we do have a certain number of HUD-VASH vouchers that are allocated to each county um, in, in California. We certainly do not have enough, and we definitely need more 
more. And our VA has been advocating and working, and, and we have gotten more. But to have more hud -Vash vouchers and then to have more permanent supportive housing that's really tied to services. So they get a permanent place to live, but then they also get the services that are needed in order to maintain that permanent housing. So it's the operational part, not just it the is. physical exactly. building. Not just the physical so, so building. You're, what we need is more operational Most definitely. Uh, uh, subsidy. Um, and I, I, I agree with that. And uh, we definitely need to uh, uh, make that a priority. Um, and it strikes me also that um, uh, uh, we, we need to do more in terms of uh, making sure that, uh, I want to return back to education for a moment. Uh, one of the bills that I will be actually dropping, uh, we entered, we uh, dropping in the next uh, couple of weeks, is something called the Pro Student Act. I mean, dropping into the proposal for a schedule, as opposed to dropping. It. <laughs> Dro dropping, <laughs> dropping the bill, meaning we're gonna, we're actually gonna put it onto the, uh, un, un, uh, introduce it into the Congress formally. That's what I mean by the word drop. Um, and uh, one of the concerns I had was uh, seeing uh, uh, students. Uh, uh, veterans benefits, the, benef the, the, uh, the, GI, the post 9-11 GI Bill benefits uh, being squandered, uh, mm -hmm. not necessarily by the veterans themselves, but in programs mm -hmm. uh, that uh, were mo mainly being offered by for-profit colleges. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. And they were motivated uh, by a loophole uh, in federal, in the accounting that, the, uh, yes. uh, that, they, uh, that they're supposed to submit to. Um, it, it's a kind of a complicated story, but in short, what it was is that uh, uh, for-profit colleges were incentivized to actually target veterans mm -hmm. into their programs. Mm -hmm. And very often these programs used up their benefits, uh, gave them an education that didn't really result in a usable credential or credits that could be transferred uh, to a public university like UCR or Right. Uh, Cal State San Bernardino, right. mm -hmm. um, or for that matter, any regionally accredited uh, yeah. uh, uh, institution. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my legislation would specifically address this targeting of veterans. It's enough. We've already we've already seen the challenge itself just to get to a, a good institution, mm -hmm. uh, to be distracted and diverted, and to ha to an institution that uh, is not a good actor. Uh, and then also have your benefits drained away, I think, is a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, so uh, uh, that is part of what I'm uh, also trying to do to help veterans. And we were also discussing a bill, it was AB-13, it was about the in-state, in there's a big misunderstanding, I think, about the in-state tuition and having to pay if your residency doesn't lie here. Well, actually, uh, that's another element so uh, AB is a, an assembly bill, uh, mm -hmm. which is the state legislature. I, I serve in the U.S. House mm -hmm. uh, at the federal uh, in, in Washington. Um, there was a provision also passed in this most recent veterans bill, which would guarantee veterans uh, the, uh, the ability to uh, pay only in-state tuition, mm -hmm. regardless of where they came from, what state. So that's part of the new federal legislation, that uh, the public universities offer veterans the in-state tuition. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the federal legislation. Because when you're returning return from service, you may not be in a place where you have a home or any background, and, and so uh, then you have to pay out-of-state out tuition. It, so essentially, very expensive. essentially the residency, under the, as, as I understand it, under the current law that we just passed, it was assigned into law by President Obama, would allow uh, would exempt students from having to like establish the residency. Basically, yes. they could. Okay, they so they could. They don't have to establish they, that residency. They could. They could. They could. They, could, okay. uh, they could access the universities uh, and colleges uh, at, at the in-state tuition rate. As long as they said that they would try to get residency within two years of their discharge date. That's a big one too that people don't know. That's what it was said in the in the actual bill, the revision of it. Of the of the one you're AB talking about. Um, I'm not sure about the, those. I'm just. I know about the federal legislation, uh, but I and the federal legislation. I don't know if that has that requirement that the student has to establish residency. Okay. I, I just know that uh, as part of the federal legislation, uh, I think 
the universities are required to, the public universities are required to offer in-state tuition. And then, um, Congressman Turkana, I'm glad to hear about that because we saw a lot of that targeting of veteran also with the VRAP program, you know, by these for-profit um, universities and then getting them into training programs that really then were not translating into um, appropriate jobs and they also were not doing a good job with even the um, follow-up in terms of job placement and things like that. So I'm, I'm very excited to hear about that. All right, well, the, the, there's a, another related question about this. Uh, uh, we keep hearing about the drawdown of the war, uh, maybe not so much right now, and the Department of Defense cuts where hundreds of service members will be separating voluntarily or be forced to retire. With so many more expected to separate, does Congress have a plan to help absorb the veterans that need its support? And are the organizations right now able to handle uh, a, a rush of veterans coming back from the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, presuming that they will come to an end in the way that happened after uh, Vietnam and Korea and World War II. So is there an adaptability to provide more resources when more resources are needed? Well, okay, that? well, I'll, I'll begin. I would say that definitely not. We definitely don't have um, enough resources. And um, one of the issues that we're facing, and I'm sure the congressman um, knows this well, is that we have fewer resources in Riverside County um, than they have in San Diego um, and in Los Angeles County. Um, and we're, we're serving a large veteran population. And so I know um, through some of the national organizations um, and also through some of the um, um, COCs, we've been really working at um, trying to bring additional resources, um, especially for um, homeless services and educational services, to Riverside County. Um, because we are, we are, we have been historically underfunded and remain underfunded. Um, so what we do is we kind of, we, our collaborations are very good, and so we work together and really stretch that dollar. Now, um, now there is a R Riverside County office for uh, homeless services? services? Um, yes, for veteran services, for homeless services, and uh, they're, they're, the Loma Linda VA um, is the VA that serves our catchment area, and they have um, homeless services also. They have a whole um, homeless services unit um, that goes all the way from outreach to hospitalization. Um, so there are not enough um, resources, and we really um, need to work together as service providers to bring more resources here. We need to be better advocates. This goes back a bit to a previous discussion, but I wanted to add the issue about providing structures for homelessness is not enough. I've been working with the Path of Life Family Shelter. Someone is moving into a home uh, built by Habitat for Humanity. This is great, but there are no furnishings. Yeah. And so it's in addition to support and everything else you need, people who are homeless aren't going to come with a bed with sheets and towels. And so fortunately, the Riverside local churches are, are The faith-based community is very, this. yes, it's But there's a, a need there that when you have to think of what it would be like to be in that position and what challenges you, you then face to getting back in a home, uh, it's very complicated and takes a lot of thoughtful intervention, as it were. Yeah, and I think that goes back to the what um, the, the person that was talking about in terms of, you know, all of the money that's been allocated, again, through Prop 41, which, you know, those of us who are in the veterans community and the service community pushed very hard for and worked very hard to get that vote out. Um, but now, again, yes, looking at what services are needed, what supports are needed to really help the person get into a home and then also be able to stay in that home. It's so easy to lose a home, so hard to get back yeah. in. This is a question, uh, first for Jackie, but for everyone here. Um, uh, there's an expedited citizenship program for vets. You were talking about people who then you know, are traumatized, commit a crime mm -hmm. uh, under the effect of that trauma, and then are booted out of the country after they've served veterans. Uh, this can't happen to citizens. Mm -hmm. So. So do you have any thoughts or views about this expedited citizenship program that the Army Reserve Legal Assistance for instance, units can, can help provide and what the government can provide for helping people who've served in our armed forces become citizens fairly quickly? Please. Okay, well I had a discussion with this about someone uh, who was on the opposite side that I was and they had mentioned that um, 
it is a, you are able to get your citizenship while you are in the military on active duty and people just sometimes don't do it so that responsibility lies within the individual and that's that is a that is a fact and we do have to be responsible we do have to take care of ourselves we can't you know rely on the united states for everything to give us benefits and services for everything we do have to take care of ourselves so um with them being citizens it, it is partially a fault of theirs if they haven't gotten it while they're in but also like people who have green cards they got them taken away as soon as they did commit a criminal crime or criminal offense and then they were deported um i think what we could do is make um if you're serving in the united states navy army marine corps coast guard air force it is mandatory for you to become a citizen if you want to be in our in our, I mean, it only makes sense. Um, and that would help everyone out. That way they could get the services here. They could go to school if they wanted to stay here. They could always go back home if they wanted to, but at least they have that choice. And that's a big thing is choice for people. But it has to be mandatory because when you're, <laughs> most people who join the military are straight out of high school. They know nothing, you know, almost nothing. They don't know how to write a check. They don't know how to pay bills. They don't know how to do so much. And so by the time you get out, you, you really don't think about that. And so you're kind of lost when you do get hit with everything. Um, and then again, people commit crimes for stealing things because maybe they can't eat or maybe they can't do random things. And you don't think about everything that you're going to have to face as soon as you get out. So making it mandatory is for everyone's own good, really, just like uh, TAPS class for everyone's own good uh, transitional classes, but... Um, well, I think, Jackie, um, you've given me a great idea here. The president really made these courses mandatory. Of course, you think there needs to be a TAP. That's the second great idea mm -hmm. I heard mm -hmm. here today was uh, a, a transition part two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there needs need to, to be a deeper part we, of the we need, we need to check in with you. Because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we're, for a lot of, we're talking about a lot of young people out of high school. Yes. Who, mm -hmm. um, yeah. they, they have gotten more disciplined. Mm -hmm. uh, they were taught discipline in the military, but it's, it's not been complete. They, mm -hmm. They've not been able to get the full range of autonomous skills and autonomy. Because mm -hmm. uh, everything really, that really makes them an autonomous yeah, citizen. Everything's mm -hmm. been everything's been done. That's that's how my, my staff taught you know they said, you know, you get a check, your rent is paid, your food's yep. taken care of, if you live on base, your child care is taken care of, all this stuff is taken care of, then you're then when you're done, you're cut off. And none of that stuff is taken care of, and you're supposed to know how to negotiate all these systems. Mm -hmm. But the idea that uh, for those uh, who uh, were immigrants and who served in the military, served our country, mm -hmm. I, mean, I think I think Americans need to get behind the idea, should oh, get behind yeah. the idea that yeah. along with your transition courses that you're required to do, mm -hmm. that you need to get the citizenship oh, yeah. done. Oh yeah, most definitely. Right. It just it just opens you up to being a, a you know, uh, even a more contributing American. Yes. Uh, and so I'm, I, I like that idea a lot. And it protects so, um, them is, a is lot. Is there something so. though that is expedited? Or, I mean, I thought I heard something that was saying that for our s service men and women, it would be, you, there would maybe be a more expedited process? They were or I think it was a Navy I, or an Army program that they were talking about. Was that oh, what they were referring because to? Because I think that, that would be yeah, great they were talking also. About the, the Army has a local, um, it's here, uh, uh, legal assistant units that help people do this. Uh, okay. But the idea we're talking about now is, as part of your transition out, back to civilian life, mm -hmm. you've put your life on the line for your country or mm -hmm. the United States. The next stage is to make sure you're officially recognized as a citizen and then protected as a citizen the way uh, we all are who are citizens, so that then you could go on and draw without well, fear of these benefits. Well, and see, here, here's a, I, I wanted to... Uh, some of the so many things go through my head here. Uh, there's a wonderful program, a diversion program here yeah. in Riverside County and yeah. other jurisdictions across mm -hmm. the country. Uh, Judge Mark Johnson does a tremendous job in veterans court. Mm -hmm. So if you do get into yes. trouble with the law, uh, and they won't do this for everyone, uh, you know, if, if you, um, no, in other words, not you have to really demonstrate that uh, you're a good candidate for this. Mm -hmm. And um, instead of being put through the regular judicial process, the veterans who have gotten in trouble with the law can go to veterans court. And um, often that means you go through substance abuse um, treatment. Tra right. uh, mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a there's a whole range of things that the judge has at his discretion, and it's a very informal uh, setting. 
well, it's, it is formal in the sense you're going before a courtroom and a judge, and the judge is there. And uh, um, but uh, it's less formal in the sense that it's less adversarial between, say, the, the DA and and defense counsel. Mm -hmm. But the, well, I think what we're saying here is, if you were an immigrant mm -hmm. and you served this country, um, we shouldn't have just used you up, yeah. deport you when you make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, you, or you're having trouble uh, with substance abuse because you're trying to deal with your suffering and the pain in yeah. a certain way. And we need, to, we, need to, we need to do right by you as well. Mm -hmm. And I know, I know, and I owe it to the Navy, um, and I'm sure any other person that served owes it to any branch to make them culturally aware. And we couldn't be culturally aware without immigrants serving in our <laughs> in our our armed services so it's it is crazy to me how he, how you said i mean we do we take them we use them and then we spit them out and then and that's it and that's it for them and there are some great people who are not from this country i'll tell you that right now they are they are intelligent they are skilled and they are they are personable people they're people number one and they're they're awesome well me if i could just say when i when i met with secretary shinseki uh one month into being a newly sworn member of Congress, he had a, a painting of the 442nd, um, I think the Lost Battalion of the 442nd Infantry. It was an all Japanese American fighting unit. And they fought valiantly in, in Europe, and were one of the most decorated and most highly decorated military units, suffered tremendous casualties. And he pointed to me and he says, Congressman, you would not be a member of Congress today were it not for that battalion of Japanese Americans who, uh, who established mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know, Japanese immigrants as citizens of this country, yeah. the mm -hmm. contribution to the United States. And so I sort of see that in, you know, in line, the, the, the idea that, that new, way, new generations of immigrants um, have demonstrated their, their love of this country mm -hmm. um, and have bought a place with their service and often with their lives, uh, you know, uh, a place for them and their families mm -hmm. uh, to be so, a part of our country. And so if I can just, I just want to make sure that everybody, because you point out a wonderful program at the VA, and so it's called the VJ or the Veteran Justice Outreach Program. Um, and. It, it's a wonderful program. It provides case management services um, as well as legal services. You're absolutely right. There's a judge that hears all of um, the cases, and it is an opportunity usually for um, those veterans um, who go through the program and complete the program to actually have their record expunged. So for a young uh, veteran who are coming home and made a mistake, um, you know, then to have their record expunged and not to have this felony, you know, follow them for the rest of their lives is wonderful. And so maybe Maybe we can talk about, you know, w with that program, is there any um, opportunity, you know, for there um, to be also some support um, with citizenship and, and that kind of support also. So I, I don't know, uh, but it's a wonderful great. program. It'd be great. As we're drawing to a close, I should point out, one member of our audience has pointed out that the reserves do have a, a more graduated out-processing, mm -hmm. I call it, I guess, yellow ribbon, is it? Uh, so that there's a, which goes 30, 60, and 90 days after coming back. Uh, because of, the, of being in the reserves, you continue in the reserves, mm -hmm. uh, and so there is there's, that might serve as a helpful model for uh, improving the um, the educational opportunity for a transition, not just one Excellent. course or one week, but and they do on. have their own uh, GI bill as well. They have a, a certain um, another. I guess expense for that, so that ad actually adds to your benefits too if you do your reserve time. Now, I wanted to thank you all for listening to this conversation. Thank you for coming. Uh, think about what all of us can do to help support veterans coming back and making a peaceful, uh, happy transition back into their civilian lives. Uh, it's part of the life cycle of a veteran. You are born a civilian. You serve in the armed forces. You lose all the freedoms you have as a civilian. You're told what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And then you, you do it well because you obey and follow orders. You have acquired skills, come back to civilian life, and need to be helped, encouraged, and welcomed back to this uh, existence that we are happy to have because we have armed forces 
protecting us. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, guys. This program was one of five public conversations exploring different facets of the veteran experience conducted during the summer of 2014 as part of War Comes Home, a Cal Humanities statewide initiative to open minds to the critical issues veterans face when coming home from war. How should communities welcome service members back? How can we build bridges of understanding between those who have served and those who have not? For more information, visit www.calhum.org. Public Conversations is a project of Cal Humanities in partnership with the University of California Humanities Research Institute, the California State Library, and California Public Libraries. It is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Bay Tree Fund, the Whitman Institute, and the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services under the provisions of the Library Services and Technology Act administered in California by the State Librarian. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this recording do not necessarily represent those of Cal Humanities, the University of California Humanities Research Institute, the California State Library, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Baytree Fund, or the Whitman Institute.